everyone for being here this evening. I appreciate you all and, uh, and your time. Uh, I'm Gul Marshall. I am the head of the Department of Sociology at U of L. And welcome to our department's annual John Rieger speaker series. Dr. John Rieger was an integral part of our department. Uh, he retired last summer and uh, passed away soon after. A few years before his retirement, uh, he gifted the Department of Sociology with an endowment to invite guest speakers. So we're very lucky to have Dr. David Palo here this evening. Uh, this year, because we have the event online, we were able to invite two speakers. Uh, so we have Dr. David Palo this evening. And then on April 8th at 6 p.m., we're going to have uh, Dr. Kathy Kuhn from the Metropolitan Housing uh, Coalition at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, and, and so please do mark your calendars for that. And um, we have Marcy early this evening with us as our ASL interpreter. Thank you, Marcy, for being here. And I would like to thank also uh, the committee members, John Rieger seri uh, speaker series committee members, Dr. Latrice Best and Dr. Uh, Mark Austin. Um, and I would like to thank Anthony, Anthony Hanley, our uh, uh, tech specialist for be playing a pivotal role this evening uh, and before uh, to set up this Zoom event. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, please do keep your microphones muted. And uh, if you have questions for Dr. Pello, please write your questions in the chat box and I will um, ask them, time permitting, to Dr. Pello at the end of his talk in the order that I receive. Um, so please. Join me in welcoming Dr. David Pello, who is the Delson Chair and Professor of Environmental Studies and Director of the Global Environmental Justice Project at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he teaches courses on social change movements, environmental justice, human-animal conflicts, sustainability, and social inequality. He has published a number of works, numerous works, on environmental justice issues in communities of color in the United States and globally. His latest books include What is Critical Environmental Justice, published by the Polity Press, and Keywords for Environmental Studies, published by New York University Press. He has consulted for and served on the boards of directors of several community-based national and international organizations that are dedicated to improving the living and working environments for people of color, immigrants, indigenous peoples, and working class communities, including the Central Coast Climate Justice Network, Community Environmental Council, Global Action Research Center, the Center for Urban Transformation, Greenpeace USA, International Rivers, Community Environmental uh, Council, the Fund for Santa Barbara, and the Prison Ecology Project. He earned his BA in Sociology and Religious Studies from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and his MA and PhD in Sociology from Northwestern University. Dr. Pello, we are very glad to have you over this evening. And uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall, for that uh, generous introduction. And thank you to the Department of Sociology for inviting me here to be a, a part of this series. I'm, I'm honored uh, to be a part of this, this important series uh, that Dr. Rieger set up. And I bring you greetings from Santa Barbara, which is occupied, unceded traditional lands of the indigenous Chumash people. Um, the Chumash territory, the Chumash land and waters um, are all uh, spaces where the indigenous peoples here have actually stewarded um, this, this community for some 14,000 years continuously. So uh, my university sits atop 
their lands and historically, traditionally, has been a site of learning and exchange and trade among Chumash and their other indigenous neighbors. So I want to honor them and thank them for the opportunity to build relationships of respect, reciprocity, and consent. So I am here to talk about struggles for racial and environmental justice in America's prisons and jails. And for me, this is a, a topic that's uh, important to me because the, the prison and carceral spaces more broadly are sites of struggles against environmental racism and ecological injustice because so many prisons and jails in the United States and around the world are actually sites where we find threats to human and non-human health. And this can include water contamination, air contamination, excessive heat, climate risks, hazardous environmental and industrial uh, toxins, and many, many other um, struggles and risks folks are facing. So I'm gonna talk first about settler colonialism and connect that to environmental justice as a field, and then talk about this concept of critical environmental justice, and then apply that to the case of the US prison system, and then I'll have some concluding thoughts. In all of my work in general, and in particular for this project, I have really three guiding questions. One is, how are social inequality and environmental quality linked? That's really the fundamental question, really, of all environmental justice studies research uh, and, and advocacy. But I'm very much interested in solutions. And so I'm going to be talking about the roles that social movements play in shaping uh, responses to environmental threats in terms of policy and, and other expressions of our desire for environmental justice. Which brings me to the third question and bullet point here, and that is, how can we improve people's quality of life, people's well-being, and promote ecological sustainability? Um, so, so that really sums up what I'm trying to do with this project and with all of my work. And uh, sorry for the, the heavy verbiage here. I'll, I'll get through these, these slides fairly quickly and get onto some more graphics. But uh, much of the grounding and the foundation of, of the work I'm doing now uh, like a lot of scholars, is really in conversation with this, this idea of settler colonialism, which is this, according to Potawatomi scholar Kyle Powis White, uh, it's a, a process, a set of processes where at least one society really seeks to permanently impose itself on the land, the water, and the aerial spaces lived in by one or more other societies, really already derive uh, their, their basis for their economy, their culture, and self-determination from their relationships with the land, with non-human ecosystems, or, or what I call our life support systems. Boiling that down more simply to the second bullet point, settler colonialism is just the occupation uh, or control over land, water, and aerial space, and people uh, by a previously external power. And of course, the United States is an example of settler colonialism, but is not the only one. Many, many countries around the world actually fit into that category. Um, Kyle, Kyle Powis White also pushes the envelope a little bit further, though, and, and really helps us step back and, and really ask this, this big question or, or paints this big picture around environmental justice and settler colonialism. He makes the argument, for example, that settler colonialism is an example of environmental injustice precisely because, at least in the United States context, that process directly undermines the ability of indigenous peoples to essentially live, to exist, to exercise their cultures, their economies, um, political self-determination, and to feed themselves. So thinking about environmental injustice in that regard really gives us a much broader and longer historical sweep uh, for, for thinking about the origins of these struggles. Um, moving on to some of my close colleagues and, and friends, and in one case, a former student, Tracy Bryn Voiles and Elizabeth Hoover, who've done some really great work on this, this question, who really point out, or at least make the argument, that settler colonialism is a framework that really undergirds all environmental justice struggles in the United States, whether we can directly sort of pinpoint indigenous people's activities or involvement or, or consequences to indigenous people's directly because environmental justice conflicts always involve land and other forms of material uh, wealth from, from our ecosystems that are just inseparably entangled with histories and the afterlives 
of conquest. So what I want to do now is, is make a, a series of arguments around settler colonialism and prisons and environmental justice to really set the stage for the rest of the talk. Settler colonialism is a core foundation, not only of the United States, I mean, that's what happened when the United States was founded. It was a settler colony and remains so, but it's also a foundation of the US prison system. And we see that via human enslavement and the human caging that really went on in uh, at least as far back to the latter half of the 19th century, when the US federal government, the army, was perpetrating and, and moving forward on extermination campaigns against what were called hostiles, indigenous folks who were simply resisting imperial expansion, who were resisting conquest. And so for those indigenous folks, many of whom were, were left alive uh, as after uh, these, these Indian wars, many of them were placed inside concentration camps where torture, where mass starvation and illness were really the order of the day. And that really sets the stage um, and builds on previous eras of, of, of imprisonment as, as a mass incarceration form of institutional expression around social policy. I also wanna make the argument that human enslavement is a form of environmental injustice. So thinking about the, the fact that the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution allows for continued slavery or enslavement in prisons, um, we have then constitutionally allowed juridically sanctioned enslavement in the United States to this day. And it's a form of environmental injustice, I argue, because human caging actually invariably and inherently imposes long-term psychological and physical and public health impacts and harms and violences on individual bodies and communities of human beings who are unlucky enough to find themselves behind cages, but also the carceral system, the prison system in the United States and elsewhere itself um, requires the simultaneous subjugation of non-human natures um, in the form of, you know, when, when prisons are actually constructed and when prisons are maintained and their day-to-day -day functioning in terms of their impacts on land, water, flora, and fauna. There's a recent article just last month uh, published, I believe it was in the Sociology Compass by, uh, let's see, Julius McGee, Carl Appleton, and Patrick Greiner that's called Locked Into Emissions that demonstrates st statistically, empirically, that the U.S. prison system is a significant contributor, significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So at every level, human enslavement in the form of the prison system is a form, I would argue, of environmental injustice. Now to round this argument out then, the third argument I'm gonna make here is that environmental injustice, of course, is a part of this nation's core, right? If settler colonialism is sort of the original sin, one of the original sins of this nation and in and of itself is a form of environmental injustice and that ushered in um, human enslavement, then we have that, that link, then environmental injustice is necessarily a part of this nation's core and its founding and its DNA. And so for me, what the reason why that's important is because that means that moving toward environmental justice probably is going to have to require activities and thinking that moves beyond the existing policy framework and infrastructure that we have currently in the United States. And by that, I mean, we have to move toward decolonization and abolition, uh, which necessarily exceed the existing policy frameworks in the United States. So that's a lot of sort of academic theoretical verbiage. Um, let's get more concrete briefly. Everybody's familiar, hopefully, with the Dakota Access Pipeline. This was the, uh, and is still, the 1100 mile pipeline that's being run through uh, many sacred sites and for indigenous communities, and the Standing Rock Sioux community in the Dakotas. It initially was scheduled to first run through the largely white American community of Bismarck, North Dakota. And then they got the memo and realized, oh yeah, that's kind of not how things work in the United States. Let's target these indigenous communities. And people have fought back. People have standard, stood their ground. People have said that water is life. Water is sacred. We are water protectors, not necessarily protesters. And this is an amazing, humongous gathering 
of indigenous nations that we've not seen in well over a century. And they ground that project to a halt momentarily. It's now moving forward, but there's hope that the Biden administration will actually listen to the voices uh, and the cries of people on the ground there. But this is a very concrete example of how the fossil fuel industry itself really reflects a settler colonial mentality and how that mentality is often reinforced by the actual physical infrastructures that we have in terms of oil pipelines. So the scholarly area that I generally work in is environmental justice studies. And this is a field that's been around for a number of decades, going back at least as far as the early 1970s, where we had empirical studies showing a strong correlation between being a person who is in the low income category and living in a highly polluted area with high, uh, high, qual um, high density of air pollution. And we saw the field uh, emerge and evolve to also include racial inequality and, and thus the, the term environmental racism uh, arose to the, 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 the fore. So this is what we find across the United States and across the world where you find communities that are marginalized by, by virtue of race or indigeneity or other uh, cultural or political or economic statuses they are also much more likely to face disproportionate environmental risks and climate threats. We're also interested in the responses, the grassroots and policy responses to this reality. And we call that the environmental justice movement. So as with any field, one of the things that many of us have done is we've said, all right, what, are we, what have we learned? How far have we come? But what are the limits of what we've done? What are the gaps that we need to address in this field. And so one, one of those uh, conversations has led to this idea of critical environmental justice. And I'm not the first person who's come up with this. It's part of a broad collective conversation. But there are four pillars that I lay out in my work uh, that constitute this, this framework of critical environmental justice. The first is to say, focusing on race is really important. We need racial justice as much as any form of justice. But there are so many other categories of difference, so many other populations who are disproportionately affected by environmental and climate threats that we've also got to focus on income, on class, on gender, on sexuality. And we also need to ask who are the other beings, who are the other populations on earth who are disproportionately affected by various um, political economic decisions. And that allows us to move over the species barrier and talk about the effects of environmental injustices on non-human populations. We also need to build on the good work of sociologists and geographers who say, you know what, it's great that we've got these studies of environmental justice struggles na nationally um, or in a particular community, a case study, but wouldn't it be more robust if we understood how this phenomenon really functioned at multiple scales, both geographic or spatial and temporally? And so what I'm trying to do here is say, let's figure out ways to make this field, this mode of study much more robust and comprehensive. The third pillar of critical environmental justice steps back and says, why is it that in so much of the scholarly work and in so much of the advocacy in the communities, are we almost exclusively relying on the government, relying on the state to solve our problems? Government can certainly be one pathway towards solutions, one tool in the whole tool, toolkit. But if we look at the empirical evidence, we find that over the last 30, 40 years, that at least in the United States, and I think it's safe to say for most countries, governments actually haven't delivered a whole lot uh, to progress the environmental justice agenda forward. We'll see what the Biden administration might be uh, able to deliver for us. But we really, I wanna question and be skeptical of those state-centric uh, analyses. Fourth and finally, I want to name the fact that environmental injustice and environmental racism around the planet is really driven by a logic of expendability, an ideology that says certain populations, human and otherwise, are just expendable. They are surplus. They are not necessary for, for us to, to thrive and exist. And so it's perfectly fine to dump on them, perfectly fine to poison them perfectly fine to do other forms uh, of violence against those communities. And I push back, as have other scholars, against that logic of expendability by embracing a very normative, a very ethics and morally driven idea of indispensability. And I draw from the work of a whole host of activists, scholars, journalists, 
Martin Luther King, uh, the great Canadian journalist Naomi Klein, who like many climate activists have said, to change everything, we need everyone. We are all indispensable partners for our collective future that is equitable and environmentally just. So what have I been doing over the last several years? Well, this thing I'm calling the Prison Environmental Justice Project, it's a multi-year study of the relationship between US prisons and environmental justice concerns. Phase two of that project is now going global. I can, I'm happy to talk about that as well, but I'm using a number of research methods, historical and archival analysis, content analysis, participant observation, interviews with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated folks. And I'm also um, taking a scholarly activist approach to this. So I'm very much interested in how can we use this knowledge to, to foment social change. And so one of the, the partners in this project is the Prison Ecology Project, uh, which is also connected to the Human Rights Defense Center, a legal group uh, that, that advocates on behalf of prisoners in the United States, and has also um, given birth to something called the Campaign to Fight Toxic Prisons. So these are all three or four of many partners, community-based partners that we are working with in this multi-year project to again, translate this research into action, into action in support of human rights, um, the rights of, of incarcerated persons and in support of environmental justice in these carceral spaces. So one other point I wanna make is that there's a, a literature that I do draw on that I connect to environmental justice studies that some people have loosely called critical prison studies. And this in many ways is uh, overlaps, uh, but also extends beyond what we would see in maybe typical sort of criminology, criminal justice studies. And this is a field that really sees prisons and carceral spaces as forms of racialized, gendered, sexualized, and classed, and colonial oppression, right? That those things aren't incidental to the prison system. They're at the core, right? Uh, the prison system is set up, at least in large part, to neutralize, to contain, and to dominate uh, these, these various populations. Prisons, as I've also said earlier, uh, then constitute a core logic of American society. And unlike a lot of folks who would prefer reform and tweaking at the margins of this system through various policy mechanisms, and Joe Biden is one of them, who has pushed back strongly against defunding the police, um, the preferred solution, or at least one preferred pathway is, is abolition, literally dismantling uh, the prison system and rethinking accountability and restorative justice in ways that don't really center on and require punishment and torture the way our society and frankly most societies prison systems do. So let's take that critical environmental justice studies idea and try to map it onto the prison system in the beginning again with this first pillar um, examining multiple categories of difference. So let's start with race and class. This is one of my favorite protest placards. Let me say it out loud. The whole damn system is racist as hell. Well, it's also classist as hell. Um, if you've not been living under a rock, you probably know that the U.S. carceral system is overwhelmingly made up of people who are very poor and mostly non-white, uh, you know, full stop. It's also the case that in the United States, no, car no country jails or imprisons more women than us. And um, this, of course, is connected to the fact that women constitute the fastest growing population of folks in prisons. OK, so we've talked about briefly class and race and gender. Let's talk about immigration status. This is a photo of the Northwest Detention Center, a privately run and operated immigration prison in Seattle, Tacoma area. It houses up to 1,500 immigrants, folks who are awaiting trial, awaiting hearings to see if they're gonna be deported. And right smack dab next to this prison, which as I've argued already, is a form of human caging and therefore is a form of environmental injustice. Well, right smack dab next to this is a federally designated toxic Superfund site. This is a trend that we are seeing throughout the United States. Probably wouldn't surprise anyone. Okay, we're putting people whom we don't want we don't really care a whole lot about in spaces that are already inherently torturous. Well, who the hell's gonna really care all that much if we're also placing them in spaces that are toxic, right? Or right next to toxic spaces. Um, so we're working on documenting that. 
So we got race, class, gender, uh, immigration status. Let's talk about disability status. This report by Human Rights Watch from 2015 really documents in, in excruciating details the ways in which many persons with disabilities in the United States carceral system are subject to a level of torture and, uh, and violence that uh, is, is really almost exceptional or certainly unique in the, in, the, in the sense that many folks in the system who have various cognitive impairments and, and mental disabilities may not respond to commands or demands by corrections officers in the ways that the rest of us might, right? And so there is little allowance for uh, neural diversity in the system and a whole lot of allowance for violence. And so oftentimes when a prison guard or a corrections officer isn't happy with a response or a non-response from a person with a disability, they will often spray them with pepper spray and it contains that chemical compound OC that can lead to all sorts of harm, burning of the skin, of the eyes, positional asphyxiation, and even death. So uh, let's go moving from disability to youth and age. So again, looking at multiple categories of difference and how these intersect with environmental harm with an eye toward creating a more robust theory and understanding of environmental injustice. With an eye also then, of course, to creating a much bigger tent of who can be involved in environmental justice activism and advocacy. This is a picture of the headquarters of the Oregon Youth Authority, the government agency in the state of Oregon that is responsible for managing and overseeing and supervising the juvie system, the juvenile detention system. So that system has youth ranging from ages 12 up to 25. And you know these folks were already caged. And well, it turned out that right around the time the Flint, Michigan lead poisoning crisis was making headlines in many states, like in Oregon, a lot of politicians were saying, maybe we have the same problem here. We need to do lead testing. Somebody had the bright idea to do that in the prison system and in the juvenile detention system. They have 11 juvenile prisons, fully nine out of those 11 facilities had actionable levels of lead and copper in the drinking water. So you had youth who were already dealing with the torture of being caged, then being exposed to contaminated water that was at a level that it really raised red flags for, for policymakers. Um, so, so this is an example of how people are, can be multiply disadvantaged. Okay, so we've talked about youth, age. Let's now cross the species boundary and go to the great state of Kentucky, where in Letcher County, what would have been U.S. prison Letcher uh, in Letcher County was slated to be developed and, and built there. This would have been the most expensive federal penitentiary in U.S. history. And was, if you, so that's why I've got the picture of a pile of money on top there. On the lower left, you see a, a rather dramatic uh, scene of mountaintop removal. Something folks in my, you know, from where I'm from, uh, I, I'm actually from Tennessee. So uh, I was once your neighbor. Um, you know, we're not strangers to this. Mountaintop removal uh, is, is a method of getting at coal seams and mining coal that is quite violent, quite horrific, basically involves blowing up mountains, right? So the days of you know, sinking a shaft where people are going down into the mountain, doing that hard, dangerous work, you know, creating a lot of jobs through that process. In many parts of the country, those days are over. This is something clearly Donald Trump and his ilk are completely unaware of. Coal industry is not really interested in creating jobs. They're interested in getting coal, mining coal. This creates enormous ecological and social violence and destruction. Why am I talking about this? Because that site is exactly the site where USP Letcher, this prison, was going to be laid on top of. So we have multiple layers of ecological and social violence converging on this one site. This site that also would have been in fairly close proximity to lower income communities and communities of color, thus raising environmental justice red flags as well. Let's then go to the lower right-hand corner, this little critter there, the Indiana bat, close, close cousin of the gray bat, both of whom are endangered species suffering um, from white nose syndrome, which our top biologists 
uh, are still trying to wrap their heads around. We're not sure exactly what is causing this or how to fix the problem of white nose syndrome, but we do know it's wiping these populations out. This is relevant to this, this case because one of their habitats is right there on this site of the prison. So what we saw was an enormous mobilization of people in Kentucky, in Letcher County, and their allies around the country and around the world, including people behind bars, incarcerated people who came together and looked at the environmental impact report associated with this project and successfully argued that it didn't take into account all of these impacts. And so in July or June of 2019, the Federal Bureau of Prisons withdrew the proposal, withdrew the application to build this prison. In my opinion, a massive victory for environmental justice, climate justice, uh, and prisoner rights. So, so there you have it. That's the first pillar. We're really trying to expand these categories of difference to get a much more comprehensive sense of who is impacted by environmental injustices, which then gives us a much broader idea of who could be mobilized in support of environmental justice. So let's move to that second pillar, multi-scalar analyses of these struggles. Starting with the micro scale, I'm very fond of drawing on the great work of many feminist scholars who have really for decades argued that if we're focusing on the micro scale, a very, very important way of doing that is focusing on the body. And feminist environmental justice scholars uh, and, and Chicano studies scholars like Sheree Moraga have argued that if we redefine our bodies as land, as homes, as part of the environment, then we can much more effectively personalize and politicize environmental justice issues that often might seem abstract for folks. So let's do that. The body is a site of many, many an assault. Um, I mentioned this already with respect to disabilities and prisoners. Um, this is a, a picture, a couple of pictures from the group Black and Pink, which is a wonderful group that advocates for incarcerated persons or LGBTQ, or HIV positive, and have pointed out, as has the United Nations and a whole host of other empirical studies, that LGBTQ prisoners, uh, women, um, people who are gender non-conforming, gender uh, non-binary, are facing enormous threats uh, to their physical well-being in prison systems around this country and around the world. So that's, for me, a site of environmental justice struggles if we take the body seriously. We're also then going to jump to the macro scale. Um, and one way to do that, of course, is to focus on the connection to climate change. This is a photo of state correctional institution Fayette in the great state of Pennsylvania there on, on the left. Uh, in the middle, we have a refuse site that contains some 40,000 tons of coal ash waste. And on the right, we have the town of LaBelle, Pennsylvania. So let's bring all these things together. Um, coal ash waste generally comes from one source, coal-fired power plants, the number one contributor to anthropogenic global climate change. Reason why that matters here <clears throat> is because it is creating an enormous amount of dust that is getting into the lungs, into the bodies of people on both sides of this dump, in the prison and in the town. And so uh, Richard Mosley, is a, a formerly incarcerated person who spent time at this prison whom I interviewed. And he told me, quote, I arrived at SCI Fayette back in 2009. I was in great health. I used to be an athlete and I'm a non-smoker, but within a week of arriving there, my nose started bleeding. I had breathing problems and I got really sick and had other respiratory problems. I had no idea about the coal ash, but I got sick and I got so sick that I kept a letter that I wrote. I kept a letter on me that I would have officials mail to my family in case I died. But here's the thing, David, my health improved after I got out of prison and I'm almost totally back to my original health, end quote. This was a story told to me and other investigators time and time again that clearly aligned with the medical studies that show the kind of ailments and illnesses and disease that Richard Mosley and other incarcerated persons and people in the town of LaBelle, Pennsylvania were facing are quite consistent with exposure to coal ash. So here we have multiple scales, right? We've got the micro scale of the human body, 
facing these threats to people's bodily health and well-being from a source, coal ash waste, that is directly connected to the number one contributor of global climate change. So for me, this is a very powerful, if not horrifying, example of how we can bring these multiple categories of difference together. Let's talk about the temporal scale, talk about history. Um, I spent many years in the great state of Minnesota where my son, when he was in grade school, took a, a field trip uh, every year to this place, Fort Snelling. And I was nonchalant and casual about it until an indigenous scholar pointed out, you know that Fort Snelling was a concentration camp uh, back in the 1860s. So Dakota people who were resisting US imperial expansion, those who were lucky enough to be alive after the extermination, many of them were located in this concentration camp, which was the site of mass starvation, suffering, and torture, environmental injustice, if there ever was one. I mentioned earlier the 13th Amendment. We're all familiar with this juridically enshrining and sanctioning continuation of human enslavement, not just through coerced labor or unpaid labor, but through involuntary servitude, through in the actual uh, caging and imprisonment itself. So we've seen that continue to the present day, but in the late 19th and early 20th century, we had this convict leasing system. Here is a photo of African-American men dressed out in the, the, the prison stripes who were being leased to the Tennessee Iron and Coal Company. So um, they're enslaved, forced labor, and what are they doing? They're mining, engaging in activity that unfortunately is also contributing not only to their uh, poor health, but also contributing to global anthropogenic climate change long before we, there was even talk of that. Moving merrily through the annals of American history, Another uh, really bad chapter in American history, of course, was the concentration camps that FDR set up during World War II for tens of thousands of Japanese Americans. Now, the, uh, there's many an environmental justice angle to this story, one of which is the fact that the US military repurposed a whole infrastructure and networks of pipings, of pipes that previously on military bases were used to deliver fossil fuels used to deliver oil. They then were repurposed and used in these concentration camps to deliver water. And so they were completely laced with hydrocarbons, with oil and other contaminants, thus putting the health of tens of thousands of people at great risk. So those are the pillars two and three. I wanna quickly move through pillars three and four. Again, questioning state-centric analyses and politics, meaning again, let's not just rely on the government or the US Environmental Protection Agency to solve all of our problems. We can think more creatively than that. And then again, rejecting expendability and embracing uh, a full throttled ethics of indispensability. And so I argue that much of this, much of pillar three and four is really embodied in the resistance movements that we find in prisons. And I don't wanna romanticize these movements, but I do wanna uh, focus in on a few aspects. So as we know, even if we're not talking about environmental justice, there are just a massive range of, of strategies and tactics that incarcerated folks uh, can use to try to resist their conditions of confinement and to improve their, their lot while in prison, while in jail, while in immigrant deten detention centers. For me as an educator, one of the most interesting things, in addition to all of these other um, forms of resistance is the last one here, that last bullet point, demanding educational programs, ethnic studies, women's studies, and pause for effect, sociology. And in interview after interview, prisoners have said, or incarcerated persons have said, we want education to help us with our re-entry. Those of us who aren't in prison for life, uh, we know that that will help our, improve our life chances once we uh, re-enter society, we would become a returning citizen. But in the case of these three disciplines, sociology, women's studies, ethnic studies, there has been a long interest among incarcerated persons in them because frankly, they are politicizing. They open people's eyes in ways that few other disciplines do and give incarcerated persons like our students who are not incarcerated um, a new lens on the world. And so for me, that, that's actually quite, quite affirming, if not 
self-serving of me to say. Um, but the resistance movement in prisons is also complemented by the resistance movement outside of prisons. So going back as far as the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, out here in California, we had groups like MELA, Mothers of East Los Angeles, and groups like Critical Resistance that were really bringing lawsuits uh, against politicians, against government agencies, around proposals to build prisons in or near communities of color, like South Central Los Angeles, and, and building prisons and jails in critical habitat, where endangered or vulnerable non-human species were going to be further endangered and further made vulnerable. So for me, this is really exciting because going back decades, people were already making these connections. And the group of Mothers of East LA also was fighting against incinerators, fighting against oil pipelines that were literally being driven through and built through their neighborhoods near schools in Latinx communities. So these groups were really understanding what we now call intersectionality, uh, multi-issue movement building, uh, long before uh, it, it was uh, trendy. So I think it's safe to say that the movement for environmental justice in prisons is growing. It is local, it is regional, it is national, it is now global. Um, going back to the case of Flint, Michigan, where again, we are seeing the afterlives, the continued process of people suffering from the lead poisoning crisis there. That's a permanent condition people are going to be facing there uh, for many years to come. Flint, Michigan is based in the county of Genesee, where we have a jail. And that jail was the site of lead poisoning in the water, just as it was throughout Flint, Michigan. The corrections officers and the, and the, the, the authorities there looked on at the prisoners, the incarcerated persons there, and did this. They took a drink of filtered water and said to the inmates, let Marcy get a drink there. <laughs> said to the inmates, you have a choice. You can either drink contaminated lead infested water or you can not drink at all. And this included a number of, of inmates of incarcerated persons who were pregnant as well. Water is a human right. That's a fact, at least in terms of international human rights law. It's not a fact in practice in the United States or frankly, most countries. Um, but this message was projected by an activist group in 2016 called the Detroit Light Brigade. And of course, this is a mode of activism that's taken off around the world and is, is really clever, right? It's like, okay, if we can't occupy that space, if we can't be on that site, let's project an image even from afar so we can't be charged with trespassing. Of course, the state is now catching up and making this illegal in many parts of the world. Um, but water contamination is perhaps the most pervasive environmental justice threat that I have seen in the prison systems. Just earlier uh, this year, I was talking to a prisoner who told me, quote, the water was black. Most of the time it was black or gray. These are the words of Benjamin, who was a prisoner at a, at a, at a facility near Tracy, California. Um, during that time, he told me when he was in prison, quote, I couldn't drink the water, so I couldn't even hydrate myself. So I lost a lot of weight, end quote. This is an enormously um, common problem across prisons in the United States and elsewhere. So um, I think I'm gonna begin to, to wrap up and, and simply say a, a few things. I wanna um, just again, point out that for me, and I don't wanna romanticize this too much, but I'm interested in bringing together the issue of environmental justice and prisons for a whole host of reasons, um, several of which include the fact that many incarcerated persons are interested in moving toward abolition, moving toward the dismantling of the prison system and not reforming something that for them and for many folks is just inherently violent, inherently torturous. Um, many of these incarcerated persons are speaking out in interviews with media, with, with uh, family members and supporters, and even writing articles and essays in, in, in media, and of course, bringing lawsuits. And so I think it's important to point out that many incarcerated persons are actually environmental justice leaders, are leaders in the environmental justice movement. And if going back to the idea of the 13th Amendment, if people who are in prison are in, in a sense legally enslaved, then well, 
The prison environmental justice movement is also a slave rebellion that is building on and expanding and continuing the work of what we normally think of as the abolitionist movement that is in fact centuries old. So I want to end with a story that really kind of brings all this together. And this takes us to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, just north of Lawton, Oklahoma. It's a place you can visit today, just like um, the, uh, the place I mentioned in, in the state of Minnesota, uh, Fort Snelling. This was a concentration camp for members of the Chiricahua Apache Nation, including Geronimo himself, who died in this prison after resisting US imperial conquest. It was also the site of an Indian boarding school where children from indigenous communities were ripped away from their families, family separation, that sounds familiar, um, and were brought here for cultural assimilation. The slogan was kill the Indian, save the child. This is what Lakota scholar James Fenelon calls culturicide, killing the culture by drilling into them the values and the cultural frameworks of Western culture, right? Um, this is also, Fort Sill was also a site of the US Army's 10th Cavalry Regiment, which was part of the larger group known as the Buffalo Soldiers, African-Americans whose job it was to further the conquest of indigenous peoples, further the expansion of the US empire. As an African-American myself, I will say, I am not proud of that. This story continues though. In the time of World War II, Fort Sill was also the site of the incarceration of some 700 Japanese American citizens during that mass incarceration um, ex as executive order by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then finally, under both the Obama and the Trump administrations, this site, Fort Sill, was the site where immigrant children who had been separated from their families in the 21st century were being housed, being caged, being imprisoned. And there was a movement of people from indigenous communities to surviving Japanese American citizens who had been the survivors of the camps, the concentration camps of World War II, come together to protest, to say no more, close this camp and successfully got those children uh, freed from this facility. So I would just like to, to argue that, and, and this is a picture of, of that protest, that this is an example of how generations of people can come together to work together to acknowledge and expose and resist environmental racism, resist uh, imprisonment and human caging. And this is evidence for me that in environmental justice issues are deeply intertwined with imprisonment and human enslavement and that resistance movements to against environmental racism and human caging can reveal and push back in a really positive and transformative way against the logic of settler colonialism. So I think I, I will end there and just give a big thanks to everybody, including my wonderful research team. So thank you so much. I'm happy to, to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Pello. And um, so one of the questions is from Rochelle Holm. And the question is, what can you recommend as an ideal early step by community members or prisoners or environmental justice activism? Is it formalizing a group, collecting baseline data, talking to local government or other? Yeah, really, really important question. You know, one of the things that uh, the Prison Ecology Project did back in 2015 and 2016 was in many ways just that. We began doing research on uh, the, the spread of, the, of this problem around the United States and began to map the location of prisons and what the environmental justice problems were there. And then we took it a step further and reached out to the US EPA. And mind you, this was under the Trump administration. And we successfully got the US Environmental Protection Agency to agree to use their platform, their mapping platform, which I think is called EJ Screen, um, to include prisons and jails. So, so including these issues on uh, a digital web-based platform that usually just has hazardous waste sites and sources of pollution and residential communities, but didn't include carceral facilities. 
So for us, that was a really important step to making sure that folks who came after us could continue to document that and could, could build uh, a movement. Um, so yes, I always say, uh, I love it that we live in the United States of America where individualism is sacrosanct, but we're almost always more effective when we're active, when we're acting in collective forms, when we're forming organizations. So, so start an organization that's doing that work or find an existing organization that you think should be doing that work and have a diplomatic conversation with them and ask, hey, can we build this bridge? Thank you. Thank you. And then Abina Edioma asked, fantastic, said fantastic talk and asked, how would you break this down into something accessible for students getting into activism through social media? Hmm. Uh, well, since I'm a middle-aged guy, uh, I hate to be ageist, but I'm not the best at social media. I also know that if I, I do have a Twitter account and I've never used it, because I know if I did use it, especially over the last four years, I probably would say something I would regret and maybe even get fired. But what I do is uh, I, I turn that over to my students who are very adept at this um, and, and other colleagues who have tweeted out um, some of the findings from, from many of our uh, research projects. And what we found is that, you know, we get way more attraction when other people who are frankly far more connected to social networks, social media networks than we are, then of course retweet and share those things. So, uh, so that's what I would say, find people, and maybe you're one of those persons, find people who are themselves hubs in these networks, uh, who themselves uh, you know, have a lot of followers and a lot of connections to get that word out. Another thing that my students have been working on is creating, um, again, building on mapping technologies to really show what this what this to this topic really looks like on a map of the United States, and showing in you know the state of Kentucky, for example, USP Letcher, at least that would be prison. What that would look like, people could easily point and click and open up a whole story, visuals and narratives on that, and that was something that high school students were using. So so there are various numbers of uh, technologies and tools that we can use to make this more accessible to folks. And I'll think more about that. Thank you. And Haley, Haley Metcalf asks, the Black Lives Matter movement has largely been successful in making the general public aware of police violence towards minority persons, predominantly through the use of cameras and social media. How might environmental justice activists similarly work to create large scale awareness of these issues? Do you think these processes would be effective in this scenario? Yeah, thank you for that question. Cameras have actually been quite integral to communicating the urgency uh, and, and the horror of this issue. I uh, fairly regularly will get emails from people who are incarcerated, who are sharing with me videos. I just, uh, just on Saturday, I got a, a video and, and a, a photo of contaminated water in this in this person's this incarcerated person's jail cell uh, or prison cell, and TikTok has been a, a very very useful means. There's a, you know prisoner TikTok I think it's called, where prisoners incarcerated persons are having fun, engaging in joyful activities, but also showing some of the real harms and some of the uh, the real concerns on the inside, and they're largely doing that you know, through illegal means, using cell phones, which are basically uh, illegal inside carceral facilities, but it is perhaps the best way to get the word out. And so um, so I salute those those incarcerated persons who are doing that at great risk to themselves. So that that is happening uh, on a number of levels. And Lauren Heberly asks, uh, and first says, thank you for your talk and asks, can you speak to how you resist barriers in academia to engage as a scholar activist? Is there advice you would give for graduate students that's different from what you might give to faculty? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question because of course, as a tenured faculty member, I have various protections that, that many other people don't have. I think for me, I, you know, and I would say this about activist scholarship, just as I would say about politics and advocacy more broadly, find allies, find friends. I mean, people who are incarcerated right now, 
so much of that work has been successful, not only because they've been leading this movement, but also because they've been open about needing allies and accomplices, supporters on the outside, people who have access to resources, to media that many people in prison might not have. Um, not that I'm comparing myself to, to somebody who's incarcerated. I wanna be clear about that, but finding allies. Um, the other thing that, that I've done in my career, frankly, is I try to kill people with kindness, right? Um, so I just, I think of myself, you know, I'm a Southerner. Uh, I reach out to folks. I say, hey, let's have a conversation. Let me tell you why I'm interested in this, why I think it's an important issue, why I think we need to make a change, why I think university resources could and should be used in the service of social change, and also why I think that sociologists and scholars should care about this for methodological and theoretical and field expanding reasons. So I try to check all of those boxes so that people understand that for me, it's not just about sort of my personal political agenda and you know, thumping my chest, but that there's a, a solid and defensible scholarly and intellectual rationale uh, behind that. And again, I make sure that I've got a lot of friends who are working with me helping me with that. And I've had, a, you know, Robert Bullard, really the founder of this field, he has been a mentor of mine from the very beginning, even though we were never at the same university. So I reached out to him and he was just really good at supporting me. Uh, I just got an email from him today. Uh, so, so look for mentors and supporters who can offer you protection and, and advice. So those are some thoughts. Thank you. And I think we're getting to the end of our time here, but uh, I'll go ahead and uh, read one more question uh, from Rochelle. No, I'm sorry, from Camilo Garrido. What do you think of President Biden's push to end private prison contracts? Do you think ICE should be the next? Um, I would cautiously, I'm cautiously optimistic about, about the Biden agenda. The, the thing is though, is when we, and we could go back to you know, the Obama era when he said, I'm gonna close down Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay. And all the liberals and leftists just got all excited about that. And I thought, yeah, but what does that really mean? Are we just going to shift uh, the site of incarceration to another space? And so, so I'm very much uh, pleased at the idea of, of canceling these contracts with private prison um, operators, but I think we have to think more broadly. And I think everybody uh, on the side of, of defunding the police, of abolition, would agree with that, that that can only be one step in a broader series of steps that looks to make sure that we're not even putting people in carceral facilities in the first place. So then we don't even have to worry about canceling these contracts. We don't have to worry about trying to get people out of prison. Let's not get them in prison to begin with. And so I am pleased to see these very strong efforts at decarceration, at decriminalization, um, so that you know things that were once crimes that would you know land you in jail or prison no longer or less so. And in, under the era of, in this current era of COVID-19, we've seen a number of folks in, who are incarcerated, not nearly enough, of course, but who have become eligible for early release. Uh, because, of course, it is impossible to physically distance in prison. So we're seeing a lot of positive movement in the direction of sucking the oxygen that is necessary uh, for, for the prison system to continue to function. But these are just baby steps. So I, I, I applaud the Biden administration in making this very, very important but small step. And yes, I absolutely agree that we need to abolish ICE. But we also need to replace that with a fundamental compassionate immigration policy that is married with uh, a much more compassionate understanding of how we deal with, with criminal justice and restorative justice. Um, if you don't mind, I'll read one more question. This is the last one. This is, uh, and that's uh, 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 from Stephanie. Thanks for your presentation. Your work is, your work is so greatly appreciated. We are collecting environmental QOL data here in Kentucky in our prisons, how can we supplement with environmental justice measures? Yes, so this is something that is really just information. I think a number of scholars and advocates around the country are, are just trying to figure this out. We're engaging in a lot of improvisation 
It seems like every day I hear from someone who's sending an email to me saying, look, we found another indicator of environmental injustice or another possibility for framing a positive path toward environmental justice. Uh, for example, food. Food is an extremely important issue that, that is relevant to anybody in a carceral facility. I've never heard of somebody who's been imprisoned who said, oh yeah, the food in that facility, top notch, right? There's literally no incentive of the prison system to make sure that the food is, is you know, adequate nutrition, certainly um, you know, tasty uh, or delicious. And the, you know, talk about the privatization of prisons. Well, so much of the food that is so obnoxiously grotesque and unhealthy in our prison systems is delivered by private, private companies. So that's another angle. Another angle is the medical system. Again, going back to this issue of the body as a site of struggle for environmental justice, the medical system uh, in every prison, every jail that I've ever encountered has been woefully inadequate. That's another indicator of a possibility for a terrain or a front for environmental justice. And this is real stuff, right? We just saw what a couple of months ago in Georgia in that immigrant detention facility there, people being sterilized, right? I think people are freaked out by that. They thought that was something that only happened in the 19th or early 20th century. That's a part of the medical system, right? Um, I could go on and on, but there are so many ways in which when we think, when we step back and observe, what is it that human beings need to, uh, to exist and to thrive and prosper in our environment and ask, what do those things look like in carceral spaces? That gives us the opportunity to come up with metrics and measures of what could be improved in, in incarcer incarceral spaces and what could be defined as an environmental justice issue. So, so I look forward to being in touch uh, with you and uh, hopefully we can co-collaborate and develop some of those metrics together. So feel free to reach out to me and I'd love to, to learn from you. Dr. Pell, thank you very much. We really appreciate you being with us this evening and, uh, and definitely bringing information on this very timely topic. And, uh, and I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to be here this evening as well. The questions are great. I'm sorry that I can't ask every one of them because of the, the time limitation, uh, but uh, uh, um, uh, please do keep in mind that we do have uh, another talk on April 8th at 6 p.m. So thank you again. And thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you so much. It was my Thank pleasure you. and an honor.